uh, I'm going to say my part and Sam is going to add uh, more to it. And um, the, the idea of producing mask was initially uh, came from Susie's group and Susie came to Ethiopia back in 2012 or I don't know exactly the time, but she came to the village and um, got someone and visit the village and you know, her temple Israel from Michigan with Rabbi Josh, and mm -hmm. they come up with the idea and told them like, okay, let's let's help these groups and, you know, give them a, a sewing machine. So with that sewing machine, um, you know, that is also creating a job opportunity for members of Loza, uh, the groups who are working with uh, Susie's uh, team as well. And, with COVID, you know, coming into picture, you know, the first thing that we think, me and Sam was like, okay, uh, you know, the first thing is like, it's a universal truth and coming like, you know, distribute the mask and for, for the community village. It's a luxury, by the way, like talking about mask in, in, in Kachane is a luxury. You know, it's, it's, it's people are like, trying to buy something during this time for something to eat or, you know, accommodate them, themselves with the economic impact. So mm -hmm. I, I think a Jewish organization reach out to Sam and, uh, or Sam reach out to them, you know, asking them like, the, the, those groups were collecting monies, but not for Kachane Jewish community, for, for other Jewish community in Addis. So he specifically asked them, are you guys also collecting money for Kachane? And they said, no. So Sam came to me and say, okay, let's do this one. You know, he's very, you know, motivated guy, I believe. And he said, Sint, let's do this one and, you know, try to help the community, you know, being with you and together forming a, a, a team. So. The first plan was like distributing a mask for the elders, pr priority with the elders. And the other issue was how do we get a mask? And that, that question was answered by the, the sewing machine groups who are running by the Loza and Susie. And so I reached out to Susie and try, I asked her like, can we work together on this you know, crowd you know, funding campaign so that we collect money and buy a mask from them and distribute that mask to the elders and a simple model but very interesting and uh from here i will let sam to talk about it because he is the one who brought the idea so so um so they already were making these masks and um, the idea was, you know, it's only 60 burr, which is only like less than a dollar. Uh, they can just sell them. Uh, but I'm a graduate student. Uh, I work part time. I make around $1,000. For me, uh, and I, when I calculated about how much they make a month, the $1 to us mask is like a $20 to them. And so the organization that's kind of facilitating these uh, two, so there's a, a Temple Israel. Uh, in uh, Michigan that mm -hmm. was collecting the money. It's, it's the biggest uh, um, congregation in the United States. And uh, Cultivate is a, a organization by a few agronomists, uh, which uh, includes Tomer Malki. Uh, they, they are a nonprofit in Israel and in Ethiopia. And they are the ones that brought the helped set up this, the shop. Um, and so I was talking to Tomer and I told him, look, this $20 mask is not going to be bought. You're not going to be able to sell it. Um, and even, even if you do sell it, you know, the people who need them most are not going to get them. It is imperative for us to get free masks as soon as possible to the elderly first and foremost. And so um, I actually, in my previous uh, life when I was a startup actually um, one, one of my advisors was Ken Koken who created the he was the guy who created the movie the film for Tom's Shoes I'm sure you know Tom's Shoes you buy one shoe sell a shoe and so I said you know we can buy this mask for five dollars it's still a good deal for us 
and that mask buys two, if not more masks for the community. So that was the idea of this fundraiser is to have them, uh, to employ them, to give them the money so that they're producing these masks um, and have some of these masks be sent to us. We don't need to produce that many, right? We only need one donor per two masks or so. And so if we can get, let's say, two, 300 donors um, of $5 a mask, uh, then we can get 2,000 masks to the community. And we've actually, we've surpassed that goal uh, because most people donate a lot more. So right now we've raised uh, about $2,500. So our first goal of 2,000 masks has been completed. And our second goal is to get thermometers uh, because of course somebody has to go bring these masks. And we need to make sure that these people are not infected. We need to make sure that uh, these people, when they go out and bring this mask, that they do not infect the elders. So now raising $1,200 for thermometers to test the temperature of the elders, but also test the temperature of the workers and of the distributors. And then after that, of course, there are third, fourth goals of sanitizer, of washing stations. And in total, the first phase is $10,000 in order to secure as much as possible the most vulnerable population, the elderly. Um, after that, the plan is to do a phase two, which is to help more, um, more of the community. We need more masks for the community. And we, because so many are out of work, so many are skipping meals, um, the elderly get maybe one or two meals a day right now. And as the economy gets worse, they're going to get less. So we need to make sure that the community is able to eat and that the community is able to protect themselves. And so that, that is the idea for phase two. Um, and then phase three is actually uh, to make something much bigger because um, as Sintayo said, these kids um, do not have opportunities there. Um, so a lot of times from what I understand is that you can't even get teachers. You could set up a school there, but you can't even get a teacher because the teachers are afraid of evil eye. They, Ethiopian teachers will not come to a school. So uh, we have to do better um, as the community here in the United States to get art supplies to these kids, to promote cultural exchange, to get them educational opportunities however we can. And so that's the idea of phase three. So it's a lot more than masks actually that we're working on. We, we, we really want to, um, you know, as, as it said, never waste a crisis. Um, so we, we, we cannot let this crisis happen. We cannot let these um, elders or community members die, but we, we also, I want to use this opportunity to get the word out and, and create a cultural connection and really help this communi community. Because as you can see, you know, we have Saleh, which you, who you haven't met, who is a uh, distinguished engineer, Sintayu, who is an engineer. Uh, we have Abebe Dubai, who is a sociologist. These are people who are not from a backwards town, from a backwards culture who have nothing to offer. These are people who have much to offer in the 21st century economy. And, and by not educating, we are throwing them away. And we as Jews cannot. We're only the numbers that we had in 1940 today. So we are still playing catch up. We cannot afford to throw any Jew away. <laughs> and, and it's immoral to do so as well. Currently, their production is about 400 masks a week, I believe. No, a day. A day. And, and so they can produce them quite, but we may need more. And so we may uh, need to also just buy up some masks because, mm -hmm. but um, the idea is actually to open up another. There, there's another town called Debe Braham where we could open up another shop uh, with and, and provide these women with ability to provide for themselves. Because once COVID leaves, these uh, stations stay so they can use them to so because if um, if you go over there you'll see their weaving machines they are working in middle ages if you look at their pottery barns they don't have a spinning wheel they are putting them mm -hmm. together and these are the best weavers and potters in all of ethiopia basically they sell their stuff wholesale to the ethiopian sellers that then go onto the market and the markup is huge they sell this for nothing so there's a huge, huge economic benefit, A, to opening them up, because I, 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 want, I want this to be sold um, to Jewish organizations outside and to, for the world to understand where this is actually made. 
Mm-hmm. The Jews that make these crafts, they know the tanners, the uh, blacksmiths, they, they don't get much of the be- an economic benefit. Most of it goes for much more markup to export. Um, I, you know, the main motive of set up uh, an organization like, in our village was to get rid of the middle guys. Most of the time, the middle guys are the one who get rich. Mm-hmm. So like m- m- my parents and everybody in Kajani who are living out of weaving pottery, tannery and blacksmith, their life is like hand to mouth. They're not wishing anything. You know, they believe that that's, that's their quota. But after we came, we have shown them like, okay, produce uh, Dalit, you know, back in 2007 to th- up to 2009, we were able to uh, make a, a Jewish prayer shawl, like about uh, 10,000. And we were able to sell that, that Dalits to Jewish organization all over the world. We're able to raise more than a million bro. So we were also able to open a Jewish synagogue with no help from the government or anybody. So that is a very good example of like, if we get rid of the middle guys, who are taking a benefit from both sides, I think the community can be a self-capable. And that's what we are trying to give an example in the, in, the, in the community, like get rid of the middle guy. We can export or like, there was also, I don't know, Sam also remember, we had a, a showroom in, uh, in our synagogue and there is a small showroom. It's not a selling station, but a showroom like, what are the products from the community? I believe Dr. Jack Ziller also visit that one and I had few pictures, but the idea was, you know, these are the products, the community, if you help and trying to get rid of the middle guy, the community can be self capable so that the community can build a school, a Jewish center and kids can go to school and be literate and be capable and also like um, uh, well-educated Jewish kids can be like a very good on economy to the country and to the world as well. So that's the idea of like, get rid of the middle guys. Now this COVID plan on the campaign as as well, we're trying to get rid of the middle guys. You know, if they sell this mask, you know, they might say like, okay, sell me with this money and then the middle guy will add some person to it and sell with, you know, uh, match uh, profit as well. So, uh, you know, we're gonna buy those masks and, you know, some of them would go to the elders and creating a, a, a nice business model for the Loza groups. But, mm-hmm. you know, in general picture, is it is still a humanitarian aid, but for them it's getting a lesson of how to design a business model because Definitely, like Sam said, this COVID will go away somehow. And it can be two years, three years, I don't know. But when the vaccine came, it might go away. But that business model will stay in the community. One of uh, the machines is assigned for uh, um, one young guy from the village who is mainly working on Italics. Like he knows the prayer of you know, tying the tzitzit as well and making the atarot and sewing the machine. So one of the machine is also working not only for the mask, but producing the alits as well. So uh, that is also another thing, but you know, the, the organization give priority for the mask because it's current issue. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's, it's like, since most of them are, you know, knows how to use their hand, you know, due to the culture, like we are handicrafts. So, you know, making clothes, traditional clothes, and, you know, design as well. And a lot of things can be done with that machine. So even women are, you know, due to the economic impact, usually they stay at home. Now, most of them are participating in that project. Most of them are working on producing masks. So once they know how to use the machine and get fluent on that machine, they can go to producing like clothes 
and also Dalits, you know, swing Dalits at Harods and other things as well. So it is not like a one-time shot, but it will continue. Like making a firm uh, business model is gonna be very helpful for them. And I can assure you that they are planning to, you know, think beyond COVID and producing masks as well. The, the, there are few few community the main community Jewish community in Addis is the Kajane, but there are few who migrate from Gondar waiting for Aliyah from the Israeli government. So those few people are still living around Israeli embassy, and you can't consider them as a community because they are not living permanently there. They just move from Gondar waiting an Aliyah from the Israeli government. So. Uh, that's why, you know, you can consider them as a, a permanent community there in Addis. But as a community, the Kachane is the only one living in Addis for more than 100 years, a century. So we are the permanent Jewish community. But when, uh, when I was there in Addis, um, working for Inciso, I went to th their branches just right in front of the Israeli embassy and the Gonders, most of them are living in Gondar, but when they get a, a, a paperwork done completed, they have to move from Gondar to, to, to Addis. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can be a witness as well. They are like, they've got a good support from Jews from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Israel and also from American Jewish groups. They've got a good attention and and the help and getting work together since they have got like a very formulated relation with the israeli government and also the american jewish community even those organizations working with the bonders they're not they're not very you know supportive towards our community and i have i have seen a lot of email exchanges as well like, oh, we're not gonna go to Kachane or like, we're not gonna work with them. You know, we want to work with the Gondar or like Beta Israeli who are living in Gondar. So that kind of a pushback is the hardest one to break. But I have tried personally, like, you know, getting a close relationship and getting an advantage and working together, but we couldn't get that, that, that advantage or we couldn't get that relationship in because of a pushback from their donors, funders, even, you know, from Israeli government as well. You know, it's very tough. And so, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, what I saw, so I, when I went to Gondar, is it's no longer a community there. It's more like a refugee camp. Yes. Um, they are, there's a rabbi there and he's teaching them they are they are doing the Israeli halakha to get out of there, um, and there is a Jewish agency there. There is a Jewish embassy there. It's there's a uh, like a barbed wire fence. It's very like closed down, um, and in essence, what the Israeli government is constantly saying is they're almost all gone, and then a few more end up. Right. And they're they're kind of trying to say we got them all. Solomon happened. Mm -hmm. We got them all. And there is an issue with the Kachene one because, and, and there, here's the difference, is Gondar was the seat of a Jewish um, kingdom. Mm -hmm. Million people, Jews, who were there. And therefore, there are many, many almost cities, villages there with Jewish, uh, uh, ancient Jewish uh, headstones. You know, there are synagogues there. It was easy, and, and there was a Torah there. And it was easy to say, these are Jews. With the Kachene Jews, because again, they lost their papers along the way. This happened to me too. My grandmother's uh, birth certificate was burned when she was uh, during World War II. So she, uh, I had a hard time becoming an Israeli for this reason. And so the Kachene Jews had to basically often pretend to be Jewish. There's, of course, there's also Messianic Jews there. They're trying to pull them away. And also you have to remember, this is an economic powerhouse for Ethiopia. These are their main tanners, their main blacksmiths. They, they produce money for Ethiopia for very little cost. And so there is a incentive for Ethiopia not to let them go. 
And there's also an incentive for Israel not to accept the people from there. And they, I think they have a lack of understanding that Addis Ababa Jews are very different from Gondar Jews because Gondar Jews is rural. There is nothing there. When, when Gondar Jews came to Israel, and clearly even a rural Jew can become a very successful Jew, as we see what's happening in Israel. But these are not the same. These are city Jews. And so, is, and this is kind of why I'm having this talk right now, is because I want Israelis and Americans to see Sintayu and other Jews from Kichene to understand that these are, this is a very different community. Um, and so that's a, there, are, there are a lot of political issues considering with poverty and difficulty with assimilating Jews that come from Ethiopia. Um, and so getting people to accept Kichene Jews because there are so many different communities, because there's so much politics there, uh, has been difficult. And it is very, again, the distance between Gondar and Kechene is, I think it took me like 12 or 13 hours by bus. Yeah. Wow. And when you're driving by bus, you see kids walking barefoot and just huts. This is, uh, Addis Ababa is the seat of African Union. This is a city. When you go to Kachena, which is right there in Addis Ababa, there are no more paved roads. There is no more sewer system. There is no more electricity. You've, and this is right outside of Addis Ababa. And when you go to Gondar, it's even less than that. If you go into a bookstore there, there will be 25 books. So the distance between Addis Ababa and Kachena is about 150 years. The distance between Addis Ababa and Gondar is about 300 years. There is a city there, but it's very small, very isolated, and generally the, the Jews who were living in those areas are very provincial, very different community from the Kachene Jews. Um, and so the, the, the benefit to the government in Addis Ababa is obviously much less from those Gondar Jews. And even there, you know, the, the, the money that they asked for those Jews from the Israeli government in the 1980s was absurd. Yeah. Am I right? Uh, I think that's that's kind of a more political question. Okay. I can say. I mean, uh, uh, the first the first person who came to Ethiopia back in 1900, 1900, uh, who wrote about the Ethiopian Jewish existence, like after. 200, 2,600 years back after they moved from Israel to Ethiopia, like in 1900. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jakob Vizlovic, uh, he's mm -hmm. a rabbi, he came to uh, Ethiopia and he visited both of them, like the Jews in Gondar and the Jews in Shawas with my community. So he visited both of them. So what happened was, uh, I, 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 this is a story that I heard from uh, from our parents. So what happened was, I think uh, Jakob Vizlovic uh, arranged a meeting on Saturday, which is on Shabbat, and he asked them, can I come? He, I, I think this is a kind of like, are they Jews or not? That kind of thing. So he tried to uh, get to them like an, for a visit on Saturday and they they told him that, that no, Saturday is not a good day and so we're not going to contact you, that kind of thing. But he, the research that he wrote uh, and also confirmed by Professor Richard Pinecrest as well about the visit in Gondar and in North Shawa. So with that being said, he wrote his own visit but you know when he go back to uh, Alexandria and back to Israel again and also visit Europe in France. I think he took uh, two or three kids from Gondar in the state of North Shawa for uh, mm -hmm. like international training. This is back in 1904. So mm -hmm. that creates a good relation between the, you know, the, you know, the, the Jews in Gondar but not the Jews in North Shawa. So uh, you know, some of them from the Ethiopian Jews create a good relation, get a, a good education in Europe and come back and represent the Ethiopian Jews and especially the Gondars. And that creates a good relation and a good bridge. So 
no question of like, oh, are they, you know, you know, are they a Jew or not? You, you, initially, it was not a question of being a Jew or not because we are one of the ancient Jewish community detached from the modern one that we don't know about the history of Talmud, whether be it a, a Jerusalem Talmud or like, you know, a Babylonian Talmud. Babylonian. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know about that one. You know, we detach back in the time of the first temple. So mm -hmm. uh, we exercise the most pre-Talmudic one, the, you know, the custom. So when he came and visited the village, both of them, he have seen those things like very pre-Talmudic one, nothing about Talmud. So he wrote that research and back, and after that, the communication breaks, but the, Gond the Gonder, like the Beta Israeli in Gonder, since some of them went for a training in, 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 in Europe and in Israel, in Alexandria and in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt as well, they got a good relation, not with us. So that creates a, a, a point of segregation, thinking that, you know, since they had a good relation with the path, they were easily accepted and their aliyah was smooth. But ours, that in despair, even if the elders from, uh, uh, during the aliyah process, elders from uh, the first aliyah back, I think, uh, before 1985, mm -hmm. and elders from the Gondar, they came to our village and had a discussion with the elders as well, saying, okay, we are trying to go, and we are trying to move to Israel and be prepared. And that conversation was held before the Aliyah uh, happened, and there was a good relation. Finally, the Derg regime came, and which is a socialist regime, which completely reject any, um, you know, Zionism activity or like labeling any activities affiliated to America and Israel as a, an imperialist. And, you know, since that government was socialist, it was very tough to do anything like integrating with the Gonders. So when the, Isra when the Israeli, um, you know, government and also the Americans came, they were in rush, like, you know, taking the Gonderian Jews out of the crisis. You know, at that time, it was a time to collapse. You know, there was a fighter, there was a, a war, like very intensive war for 17 years. Um, since 1974 up to 1983, there was there, 1992. I'm sorry, there was like intensive war between the socialist regime and the, you know the uh, fighters, the guerrilla fighters. So when the Israeli came, they tried to you know get you know get out of Gonder, the Gonder and Jew out of the Sudan border because they are close to the border, to the mm -hmm. Sudan border. So it was very easy for them to, to take them out. But the Shuan Jews, like the Kajane Jews, they are in the middle of Ethiopia, even in the map. So it, it was very tough for them. So what they did was deal with the government and ask them, okay, please, we're gonna take these Jews, um, you know, from Gondar and move them through the bus and get them to the, to the airport and take them all nothing about the Kachane Jews at that time. So we left behind and we are still suffering due to that one. Those are only limited for the Gondar Jews because once they do the major uplift from Ethiopia, it is like bringing your family. So if you have a family there in Israel, Sorry. go to the absorption center or to the absorption ministry, and ask the government, hey, I've got a family there, you know, you know, this is my brother, this is my uncle, and related with this one. If you accept me as a Jew, you need to bring that guy as well. Okay. Yeah, point of representation there in Israel. But for ours, there is none. It's, it's hard, you know, to push the Israeli government from there. So I, I think that the last two or three years, there was a... Um, young groups from in situ as well go to Israel and push uh, the Ethiopian rabbi, the Ethiopian chief rabbi, and uh, chief Kesim as well, 
And the, the Ethiopian chief, Rabbi, I have a video of saying that, uh, oh, the Northern Shoahs are Jews. We left them behind. The Ethiopian chief, Rabbi, Kes Hadana, the chief, Rabbi Hadana. So he was the chief, Rabbi. He specifically said that, yes, the Kachane Jews are Jews, but we left them behind. So these are the word from the Ethiopian chief, Rabbi. And there is internal discussion uh, of raising that issue so we can push uh, to the absorption uh, ministry and other political moves as well. But still, uh, I, 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 I don't see any progress on that one. And which is also create a lot of uh, messes on, on the current situation as well, getting no help from anybody, like nothing. And that's why me and Sam get with the idea because he knows when he live in, in Israel, he knows the, the, the issues and getting no help is very dangerous, especially to the community like mine. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's very tough. Next one. It's a, it's a mixed feeling like, you know, I can say it's mixed. Some of them, they want to move to Israel, not for the, the economic thing, but religious thought, like, you know, this is our religious thought that we have been dreaming for more than 200 and 2,700 years. So mm -hmm. fulfilling that religious thought is the priority. So that's why I am saying it's a mixed one. For example, if you ask me, I would love to live in Israel, see how the life is going on, like Sam did, you know, Sam moved there and he got his citizenship and enjoy the life. So I want to do that. Not just getting to the economic advantage. I've got a good economic advantage here. You know, I finished my, my, I've got a job here. So, but I want to live there. I, you know, that's my, my spiritual part of, a push from inside, like, you know, even my wife wants to, she keeps saying, let's move to Israel. But, you know, that's, that's the thing. That's why I'm saying it's a mixed one. Some of them want to go to Israel. Some of them, they want to be Jew in Ethiopia and get a freedom, like being a Jew and, you know, fulfill some of the Jews tradition, like going to Israel three or four times. And some of them, you know, they want to stay in Ethiopia. Some of them, they want to move to America as well. And some of them, they don't care. So be, that is a mixed one. To be frank, my personal view is that to say, oh, you just want to come here for economic reasons is a, um, I don't want to use the R word, but it's it's not, it doesn't come from a good place because uh, the reason is, uh, when Jews came from Soviet Union, they had a choice of two places, United States or Israel. Mm -hmm. The ones that could come to United States were the ones that uh, America would accept, were the ones that were much more economically viable. Mm -hmm. The Jews in Israel, uh, those Jews would have preferred, a lot of them would have preferred to come to United States. And nobody asked, are you making an economic reason for this? And a lot of those Jews who came to Israel and were not able to make economically, then moved back to, United, uh, to either move to the United States or back to the Soviet Union. And no one asked for their Israel citizenship because you left this place because it wasn't good economically for you. Um, Americans come to Israel every single year, COVID or no COVID. And many of them are very good economically. Some of them are not. Many of them don't make it. And no one rescinds their, no one asks them, are you coming here for economic reasons? And no one rescinds their citizenship because they don't do well economically or because they choose to leave. Israel is for people, for Jews. It's the only homeland. And you can have an economic reason or you can have a Zionist reason and it, it should not matter. If you're a Jew, you're a Jew, you're persecuted everywhere else. That is the bottom line. Whether you are a wealthy American, you will be told a K-word at some point and that you are too powerful. And if you are living in uh, Kachene as poor or rich, you are treated as a Jew no matter what. And that is the reason why Israel exists, because it's the only place where you are not treated that way because you are in your, in your own place, in your own country. So 
That, that is my issue with the economic thing. It shouldn't matter. Okay. My dress that came from uh, the Tsar's decree, right? That's not a Middle Eastern dress. The mm -hmm. Russians, they love the New Year's Eve, right? Uh, right? Americans have their uh, Thanksgiving, 4th of July. Halloween. Uh, right, Halloween. It's it's a Jewish I, I call Jews are the first globalized population. Right. We went everywhere and we survived because we adapted. We retained some of our inner things, but we also adapted just because it's natural. And uh, part of my book project was also showing that different cultures adapt to different Jewish things, right? How much uh, Yiddish is in English languages that mean that in English is unpure. Right. Mm -hmm. So again, these are these are excuses and thoughts of people who do not take Jewishness into the whole. They look at this population and they're trying to find reasons of why they are not Jewish instead of looking for the things that are similar. This is part of the reason for the like this right now. What we're having with Sinta mm -hmm. is just being able to talk to the person and hear them, hear their story. I think is very powerful because you and I writing, I think, is it's still our perspective and it's still our words and it's not still first person. So I think Sintayu coming to the uh, United States and being able to, uh, is uh, the rabbi was right, <laughs> Sintayu. Um, it, it is a gift to your community that you can spread the word because as somebody like you who is eloquent and educated and shows, um, I think what happens when you give somebody a chance from that community um, and not just to a few lottery kids but what happens when you give it to to everyone? Um, you guys help also very important. I mean, you know, I, I you know, for example, um, uh, my rabbi from Wichita, he showed me how to approach the situations, and that is also a help. You know, today I am here, being on a Zoom call and discussing with you. So that opportunity ignites this one. So now we, you know, I met Jack Ziller back in 2010 and now I met you here. And it is like all rounded and we are all together some way. And, you know, I, I believe being Jewishness and also like the concept of working together, helping the Jewish community and regardless of the motives, now we came together and discuss about it. So this mm -hmm. is the most important thing, which makes me very happy. And also to tell to my daughter that, you know, even if we are too far, like a long miles away from our village, there is another village here. You know, there is another community there who think, who worry about me as being Ethiopian Jew, being a family, and you know for example sam is you know a family to me he came to my house had a coffee and a nice you know a nice communication now you become here and this is how we gonna grow a community here even if like i'm too far away from my village that is that is how i feel connected to the people like no one chooses being a Jew, right? You know, it chooses us. You know, it chooses me, it chooses you and everybody. I, I never choose being a Jew. But, you know, that goes through everybody. The trade, the happiness goes to everybody. You know, if some say that regardless of being, a, um, you know, regardless of being rich or poor, where you came from, the risk is the same. I can add one thing, whether you are Orthodox Jew, or liberal, conservative, or anything, or atheist Jew, the risk is the same. People labeled us as a Jew. They don't care about your, your religious affiliation. They only think you blood. So the risk is the same. So that needs to be formulated and you know stretched out, and that needs to be like repeated every time. And I keep you know, most people ask me, like, what is the greatest fear for you being a Jew? I keep telling them, like, the Holocaust is my fear. My, my parents never saw that. But reading the history, it tells me that, one, I never choose being a Jew, but the risk is coming there, you know. So 
I keep telling to everyone, like, you know, regardless of your outlook, the risk is the same. Being a black Jew, being a white Jew, being from Russia, being from Brazil, being anywhere, it doesn't matter. So that is my fear. And being together is my happiness as well. You know, seeing you guys discuss with you is my happiness. Because that is the moment that I feel connected. I think I, I want to add to that is, uh, and that I write in my book is, uh, people ask, how did Jews get to Africa? But the same question could be asked, how did Jews get to Russia or to Norway? <laughs> yeah. It's just as far from Israel than Africa. Yeah. Why, why is it so hard for a Jew to go south and so, and so easy to go north, right? And the other thing is phenotype doesn't matter. Phenotype changes very quickly. Look at the Israelis today. Are they white? No, phenotype changes very quickly. We adapt, you know, with the generation. Look at Barack Obama, right? Mother right. is white. Look at his father, right? So phenotype can change extremely quickly, right? The Yemenite Jews come to Ethiopia uh, within a few generations. Of course, phenotype changes. A little bit of intermarriage, you know, I'm three quarters Jewish, right? I, I don't have the, I have this Jewish look, but don't have, right? So it, it's, it's, it's very, people think of, oh, you're different, you're otherness, but this phenotype is, it can happen within a generation. It's not important, but you look at the, the customs, right? How long have people, have Jews in Ethiopia clung to this monotheistic, right? Long before Christianity came there, right? When everyone around there was polytheistic. Right, yeah. two thousand years of being a monotheistic with these same traditions, right, and and being treated the same way, as no matter how long you've lived there, this this is the Jewishness. No matter how long we live in a place, no matter how many centuries, we're treated as a foreigner, and except with the exception of Israel, that is our only home. So it's it's yeah. important to put that into perspective. Raising. Um, and the goal is to first get these masks out to the others right. and then produce the masks and send them to United States. So right now, uh, I think they did, ha they had a first run that they ordered before we started this fundraiser. Um, and now we're doing this, this kind of the second. So, uh, once we finish this fundraiser at the end of the week, um, started, I think on Monday. So when we finish this on Monday, uh, we will. I guess put in an order, but really we we will ask, um, make sure that these masks get distributed, and and uh, ask uh, uh, cultivate uh, Tomer Malki to have those masks shipped and then distribute them. What we are doing is five dollars per mask. Um, Uh, with the help of Tomer from Cantivate, and they have a manual like how to make uh, how to make uh, the masks, uh, and um, they have their own like a manual step by step how to cut uh, the, the you know the you know the the, the product and then make a mask. So mm -hmm. I believe they are following a standard suggested by uh, Cantivate and also some other documents as well. So I believe they are following some kind of standard uh, document wise prepared on, on how to do paper and they follow that one. So I believe it looks like they have a layer. I never saw that any sample of it, but they told me that they have uh, um, a procedure on how to do that, which looks like it has a layer and following a normal standard of making a mask. Something similar to that, I think it would be really nice from you. Um, a short video. Thank you, donors. You're great. You're heroes. They are. They are, really. They are. <laughs>